And welcome everybody to our webinar on meeting transportation needs through car repairs. Um, we are so thrilled that you have been able to make some time to learn about this awesome topic with us. I know that it is a little bit later on the East Coast and um, it's just a busy time. So thank you so much for everyone who's here. Um, I, my name is Anna Sofia Treyes. I'm a K-12 Senior Program Manager here at Schoolhouse Connection. And I am joined by my colleagues and our lovely panelists. Um, but before I turn it over to them to share a little bit about their experiences, I'm gonna go ahead and just do some introductory slides just so that we're all on the same page about American Rescue Plan Homeless Children and Youth Funds. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things. So this webinar should last about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, we ask that if you do have any questions throughout the webinar that you please submit them, um, but to make sure you submit them in the Q&A box in your control panel on Zoom. Uh, when they're in the chat, sometimes they get a little bit lost with everyone's um, responses. So we just ask that you put them in the Q&A box so we see them. This session is being recorded and it'll be uploaded to our webpage very shortly after this webinar has concluded. And you will be issued a certificate of attendance for participating in today's webinar. Uh, we have recently launched a schoolhouse community on Slack and it's really a space for you all to connect with each other um, and, just, and just talk through whatever it may be um, on your top of minds and your roles. And we sometimes go in there and answer questions, but it's really a space for you all. So if you have questions coming out of today, we encourage you to continue the conversation on the Slack channel. And I will just do a quick introduction about Schoolhouse Connection for folks who may not be familiar with us. We are a national organization that works to overcome homelessness from prenatal through post-secondary. And, um, we provide strategic advocacy and practical assistance in partnership with a variety of folks in the field. And we have a variety of web of resources on our website. So any information about federal and state policy advocacy, we have a Q&A from our inbox, which is very popular. So if you have any questions about the McKinney-Vento Act, the rights of students experiencing homelessness more broadly, um, you can always look in there because someone has likely had your same question before. And we have webinar and implementation tools, some of which we will discuss today. And last but not least is our youth leadership and scholarship program. So that um, application is closing up in June. So if you have not checked it out yet, we highly encourage that you do. We support our young scholars uh, with the financial support of the scholarship, but also with case management. And um, just wanna to touch base really quickly on the Dear Colleague letter that was released by the US Department of Education back in September of 2023. Um, the Dear Colleague letter asked for a couple of things and specifically asked for states to expedite funding, including uh, by modifying administrative procedures. So we know we're getting really, really close to that obligation deadline of September, 2024. And so we encourage you all to share this widely with your school business officers, uh, superintendents, and any other administrators who may be involved in spending decisions. Um, we also published a two-pager that just has a brief overview of the allowable uses that were uh, mentioned in the Dear Colleague letter. And so we encourage you to take a look at that if you're looking for some ideas for spending. And a couple of other highlights to cover is uh, the Dear Colleague letter did specifically mention that food assistance is allowable when reasonable and necessary. Um, so again, thinking about those summer months and how to support students experiencing homelessness um, when there's no other food uh, supports available. Also thinking about um, early childhood education. So many uh, activities are allowed to support early childhood education are allowable uses of RPHCY funds. I know transportation can be a really big one. Um, so that's another one that can be allowable. So really any of those activities. And last but not least would be um, just any activities to support college and career readiness. So um, thinking about providing support for students and parents to complete the FAFSA um, and really any other activities to um, ensure that smooth transition. And the last two things I will highlight are just the purchase of vehicles um, and reimbursing parents and youth for gas costs. And of course, we're all here today to talk about limited car repairs. So that is also an allowable use of RPHCY funds. Um, motel stays of three days or longer when reasonable and necessary are also allowable uses of RPHCY funds. Um, I also quickly just wanna highlight that we have 
been busy publishing two pagers um, in response to some of the webinars that we had. And so if you do want some more information about things like purchasing a vehicle or how to provide hotel stays or summer activities, we do have uh, quick two pagers that you can look into um, to figure out how to do that in your districts. And we do also have sample MOUs and forms available on our website. So again, we just wanna make sure that you have all the resources to meet that obligation deadline in September. And with that, I am gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen and turn it over to my colleague, Karen, to introduce our panelist. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you as always. Um, for those of you who I have not had the opportunity to meet, I am Karen. I'm the Senior Program Manager of Education Initiatives at Schoolhouse Connection. And I am so happy to be joined by our panelists today, uh, Claire, Melora, and Paige. Thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I will turn it over to you all to introduce yourselves. I'm wondering if you can introduce yourself and just give us some information about your district um, location, size, and then the number of students that you have identified. So Claire, I'll start with you if you wouldn't mind kicking us off. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my name is Claire Bergman. I am the McKinney Vento Coordinator um, for the Sun Prairie Area School District. Sun Prairie is a city right, so right outside of Madison, Wisconsin, um, just a little northeast of it. Um, we have about 8,400 students in our district. Um, last year, we identified 187 students, and this year we're at 301. So we've had a massive jump in, in students this year um, identified. Um, and yeah, we're, we're constantly growing because Dane County, the area we live in, is um, ever-changing. So, Thanks, Claire. Melora, I'll turn it over to you to introduce yourself. I'm Laura Horn. I am the McKinney Vento Program Coordinator with Roanoke City Public Schools, um, located in Roanoke, Virginia. I have been here for 21 years. Um, our school district is around 13,000, and um, we're right now we're a little over 600 students. Um, but typically, that's our average. Um, we have gone up closer to almost um, probably 750, um, but right now we're at 600. So I'm excited to be here, and thank you for for inviting me. Thank you so much. And Paige, I'll turn it over to you. Hi, I'm Paige Walters. I'm with Montgomery County Public Schools, and that is Montgomery County in Virginia, not Maryland. Um, I'm right next door to Melora. Um, we are in Southwest Virginia. We have just a little under 10,000 students. Right now, we're about at um, 9,700 students. Um, this year, this is my first year doing this. Um, right now we've identified and served um, right about 190 students um, through McKinney Vento this year. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, I'm so excited to have this conversation today because talking about car repairs and looking at our timeline with spending funds, um, this is a really great way to, to do those in the limited time that we have to meet those needs of students with our transportation. So um, Claire, I'll start with you. If you could talk about how did you determine that using your RPHCY funds for transportation needs um, was gonna help you to best meet the needs of your students? Yeah, so I think um, a lot of our families, uh, a car issue can really send them over the edge and, and them end up being identified as McKinney Vento, right? Or who are our families who are already experiencing homelessness really um, cause further barriers to finding housing, especially in our area. We are very car dependent. Um, our bus routes don't go very far into our city. They're really housed within Madison. Um, and only one route comes out to Sun Prairie, so it's pretty infrequent. Um, so we knew that families are really relying on their cars to get kids to school. And we know that um, transportation is a big cost for a district, right? So um, gas reimbursement is, is a cheaper option for us than providing taxis and the other services. So we um, kind of thought that car repair would be a good way to support our families so that they can continue to not only help their kiddos get to school, but hopefully help them maintain their job and you know continue to make strides towards finding housing. So those were kind of the some of the reasons that we determined it would be a good option. Thank you, Melora. I'll turn it over to you with the same question. How did you determine that this was a way to use your RBHCY funds to meet the needs of your students? Um, so how it started out with me, um, we do have um, a huge fundraiser every year and we have a pot of money that is not, it's it's private donations, so it's unrestricted. 
And so how this came up was, um, this was probably, probably a year and a half ago. Um, we had a parent that um, was out of zone. We did not have a bus. Um, we were offering, you know, other alternatives. She had a, a van. And so she decided she would drive her children to school. And then um, we were getting calls. The children were checking in late every day. There were some attendance issues. So I reached out to mom. And so um, mom said, well, I'm having trouble uh, because I have to pull the van over every so often and add water to the radiator. It's overheating. Um, just so just a series of different things was going on. So through that process, I, you know, she was talking about she was trying to get it fixed. And so I asked her, like, did she have an idea of how much it was going to cost? And did she have someone reliable, um, you know, to be able to fix it? And through the conversation, I, after she started talking about some other things, I started feeling like that, you know, I didn't want to um, go into this without knowing, okay, will fixing a radiator fix all the issues, you know, because there might be other things going on too. So at that point, um, we have a really good relationship. I sit on the um, CTE council, advisory council, it's our career technical education um, council. And so have worked pretty closely with our um, auto repair uh, program. And so, you know, just started thinking about some different things. So what I decided was I would have him, um, you know, call the instructor and said, hey, is there a way for us to, if you can get the van there for you to check it out to make sure. So he, he, we did all that. He calls me up and he's like, Melora, this is like, I don't even, this, this van's not even safe for her to be on the road, period. It's really bad. And so how that kind of started all this was they just happened to have a car um, that the students had repaired. And so often with, if someone donates a car, they do the repairs and then they sell the car and the money goes back into the program. So um, the director of the program um, is very supportive of our program as well. And so um, she actually agreed that if the mother could purchase that car, that she would sell it to her for $500 which was amazing because this car was like, had new, it had new tires and everything was, he checked it out from, you know, it was great. So she actually bought the car herself. So we didn't pay for those funds. She bought the car herself, but through this process, all of this, I had already reached out um, to my supervisor and I was like, Hey, we have these extra funds that are unrestricted. If we need to, could we use some of that money? And then I started thinking more about, I wonder if we could use ARP money for this. And then I called our state coordinator, Dr. Uh, Patricia Pop, and at that time said, hey, you know, is this something that we could possibly use our funds for? And so that's what started all of this. And then it just kind of rolled on from there. Um, what I would also say is that one of the things we've been able to do is just developing relationships. Um, and so being kind of, I kind of tag along with the person um, with our CTE program because he already had those relationships. Um, they had been working with our school division for a long time. So like advanced auto, Firestone, just different mechanics, different, um, you know, um, it was, all, um, it was another AutoZone. So different, different organizations and businesses were already supporting that program by giving discounted costs um, and things like that. So um, as we move forward, um, any of our parents that, you know, had some, if they, if they mentioned to us, they were, you know, they couldn't drive their kids to school right now because they were having car issues. I would just ask questions about what was happening. And then we've been able to help several of our families. Um, we helped one parent with putting new tires on the car. Um, and, and typically, I mean, I was kind of reviewing too. Um, typically the cost have been around $300. You know, it might be just replacing something that's um, like we haven't really spent the only one we spent probably about it was probably closer to like nine hundred dollars. What I did do was I I used part of the ARP funds to pay for that, and the other half I used out of our other money that we had, just because I wanted to try to you know you want to figure out something that's pretty consistent, and that you have to have kind of a this is the most I can do, and that's really for us to kind of look at our budget and the number of families we're serving and the potentials to kind of know where to go from there. Thank you so much. 
Paige, I'll turn it over to you for the same question. How did you determine that using your ARP HCY funds um, for transportation and particularly car repairs would help meet student needs? Well, um, kind of like the others said, we just had, um, so I started to have more families that I was reimbursing for gas come to me and say that they were having car trouble or they would call me and say, hey, can I get transportation set up because my car broke down? Um, and then when I found out that it was a possibility for us to do this, um, I went to our director of student services and um, said, I'm, I'm looking into doing this. It's been, you know, approved by the state and by the, you know, the ARP, ARP has given permission to do this as well. Is this, you know, okay with our division? I felt like maybe I needed to approve it through them. And so he took it to the superintendent and he said, sure. And um, so from there, we didn't really have a specific way we were doing it. Um, I did not advertise it. It was more kind of like what Melora said. If um, a family came to me that we were reimbursing for gas and said my car's broken down or something had happened, or when we were getting new um, referrals in and I was doing the intake and we were talking about transportation and they would say something like, for example, I had a family that said, um, you know, when I would say, what is your, you know, do you have a vehicle? And she said, well, I have a vehicle, but um, I haven't been able to afford to get the, um, the registration um, current, or I haven't been able to get, I had one that couldn't get there and they shouldn't have the money to have the inspection done. And so I just sort of used my own kind of gut. I would typically call my director of transportation and say, this is where I am. Um, you know, what's it going to do? We have transportation. How much is it going to cost for us to get this person here if it's even possible? So that I had some idea in my head of like what comparison the comparison was between getting the vehicle fixed or paying for an inspection or something like that compared to the transportation. Um, I honestly never even thought about going through any of our like automotive classes uh, within the division. Um, we have a community resource guide that's sent out and um, there are some automotive places in there who have said that they will work with families that are, um, you know, needing extra help. So I actually um, recognized one of those places called the owner and said, um, I would like to start, you know, occasionally sending a car to be worked on that the, that the school division is going to pay for um, and sort of worked it out with him. How, how will this will look from your end? You know, explain that, you know, they're, it's going to have to go through our whole system, which is going to take a while for a check to go through. And um, that, you know, pretty much, you know, I would send cars there, but once they looked them over, he would need to call me to kind of let me know what, what the final, you know, what they found, because lots of times, you know, we don't really know what's wrong with the car till we get it in there. So I just worked really closely with him and with certain families and um, was able to, you know, fix a car when it um, was really helpful to us in terms of not having to set up that transportation. Thank you so much, Paige. Claire, I'll turn it over to you for the next question. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about how that's looked with, in, um, with, with Melora and with Paige as well, but what did it look like for you when you had families um, who needed car repairs or when you were setting up transportation for them? Yeah, so um, the biggest things that we were trying to figure out similarly, like was where do we, where do we start? Where do we go? So we typically have a family send a quote to us um, that they received to get a sense of what the scope is looking like. Um, we don't, we didn't pick a particular um, site that we worked with just because a lot of our families are kind of all over the county. So it was a little hard if it needed to be towed or stuff like that. Um, so we typically require a quote. And then from there, I would contact the the site um, that they chose to get a little more sense and look at their process and procedures for payment. Um, I'm very lucky that I have a P card and my business office made it super easy. So I just am able to send the tax exempt in my P card and we get it squared away that way. Um, but overall, I would say like the biggest things that we've seen are tires, especially in Wisconsin with our crazy weather. Um, and then, you know, some oil changes and then some um, different like specific things. And I'm not a car person and I, admit that full heartedly. So I rely very hard, like very much on our transportation uh, or our buildings and grounds people to kind of help me out 
and now like make sure I understand what's going on in that sense. Um, so overall, that's kind of been our processes. If a family um, says it either to one of our school social workers or myself, like it's getting hard to get the kids to school or we notice through attendance, we'll typically ask if they can send a quote and then kind of go from there. Ask a follow-up question to that. Do you have yeah. any kind of limit or threshold of this is what we'll pay for this is versus this is what we won't pay for? Yeah, so we've done like up to $500 is kind of our max. And then um, if it's, if the quote comes in over that, we talk with the family, like if it's 600, do you have a way to pay for this? Because we don't want to set them up for failure, right? Of like, they need a certain thing. Or if there's multiple things, we try to talk with the car company to prioritize what, what do they need most that will be safe and functioning for that family? Um, so that's how we kind of start that conversation. In terms of what we do and don't do. Um, I know when I talked with our statewide person, they were a little hesitant um, for us to do specifically around um, like registration and things like that. They really wanted us to focus on like the vehicle itself functioning. Um, so we kind of stuck to those parameters for car repair. Thanks, Claire. Well, Laura, I'll turn it over to you. You've talked a lot about your partnership with CTE, and I think anything else you want to share with us around that is great. I would also love to know kind of, again, that practical piece of how you navigated some of the payments and approvals and kind of spending part of it as well. So um, I will say that I have been extremely fortunate. Um, it, it took a while, but um, you know, it's kind of like um, I just kept asking. There, there, certain things kept coming up over the past few years where I really needed a credit card for this program, so I could actually have a way to to go out and pay for things if I needed to. Um, it took a lot of conversations, a lot of explaining, a lot of documentation, um, but also I feel like you know those those conversations are very important, and we all know that. I mean, and I'm kind of like this, and I think most of us are probably that do this kind of work. I will ask for anything. Um, the worst thing you could tell me is no, but to really have your reasons for why you want to do this and kind of be able to show them. So our um, CFO, who I have you know, have a great relationship with, she's very supportive of the McKinney-Vento program. Uh, she's at every single fundraiser we ever do. Um, she understood. And she's like, we're going to go ahead and, and do this. That really helped a whole lot. The other thing is, again, um, and anyone that hears me ever speak about anything, it's about those relationships that you build. I'm a huge advocate for getting out there and talking to the people in your community. Um, having kind of going on like, you know, with um, the director of the CTE program was very helpful. Um, so basically, you know, I said to him, I said, um, the first time I said, hey, can you, can we do like a three-way call or something so you can kind of introduce me? And then I just kind of took it from there. So um, like with Firestone and some of those places, um, they actually did an invoice and just invoiced us. So if you do an invoice, like if you don't have a credit card, then most of us know we have to have like a, a purchase order and get that pre-approved. But what you can do um, is go ahead and, you know, you would have to have them set up as a vendor so that you could cut a check to them. A lot of these companies, I mean, they respect the school division. They know we're going to pay them. So a lot of them, if you don't have access to a credit card, it would be to set up a purchase order and get them to invoice you and then just cut them a check as soon as that invoice comes in. Um, that was another way that we've done it as well. And so, um, people have been really awesome to work with. Um, and I, especially when you tell them what we're doing, you know, um, and again, this blew my mind um, at, at Firestone. Um, I could not believe the deal that this guy gave us um, for this, for this woman's like, you know, brand new set of tires. Um, and I think that that's the other thing too. Um, and I, I don't know if this is a good time to, to throw this out there, Karen, but I want to share a couple other things if that's okay to really think about, especially given examples. So when we're when we're able to do something like this, we're not just helping our students get to school. We also are really helping our parents have a way to, to a job. And that was one thing. So this one parent that I helped, I mean, this woman was in tears of joy 
thankfulness, you know, because she's like, this is not only helping me get my child to school so he can be in school every day. It's also helping me be able to continue to keep my employment so I can continue to save money so I can hopefully get a place of our own. And I think that's another thing that we're, you know, it's, it's a trickle down effect. Um, the other thing that was really important, we helped this one mom that had become homeless because of domestic violence. And knowing, working with people who are going through something like that, not having a car um, is another way of just completely feeling isolated and scared. Like I have no way, even if I could, you know, I don't really have, I have to wait for somebody to come pick me up. And so this one woman that was, um, that we helped with tires, she shared with me afterwards, she was transporting her children, but she also said, you know, this has been so much more than just helping me transport my kids. She said, this has given me an opportunity to feel like I'm getting some control back in my life because this is something that was always kind of hanging over my head. You know, you don't even have a way to, to, to leave. You need to depend on someone else. So I just wanted to, to kind of share that too, because that was something that was kind of, for me, you know, when we help someone with something like this, we're, we're helping them for a specific reason, but all the other different things that are positives that come out of that. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. Paige, I'll turn it over to you for the same question. Um, you talked a little bit about kind of your purchase order process, um, but just wondering if you can talk any more about kind of what that process looked for you, how you worked with your business office. Um, and you also talked about working with your transportation director. So I'd love to know more about that too. Yeah, so um, <clears throat> we didn't really have a, a limit to what we did. Um, I never really kind of got that organized with it. It was more kind of spur of the moment type things. Um, we actually spent a, a quite a bit more on per vehicle than um, the other two panelists did. Um, but we probably only did this for about five families. Um, but we spent up to, I think on one um, vehicle, we spent maybe $1,600 um, getting it fixed. Um, typically, it really depended like that family that we spent 1600, they were out of district. And so the cost of us trying to get out of district to get them, like had that been a, a family that was within district and needed that probably would not have been able to, to cover that because the cost probably wouldn't have outweighed, you know, um, the transportation, but because they were so far away and we weren't able to do it, you know, I, I, talked with the transportation director and said, hey, do you feel confident that, you know, based on what you know of getting the buses or a van or something out there that this $1,600 would be less expensive than you um, trying to go to this other, you know, county and get them? And he agreed. So um, my school has been very um, laid back, if I can say that, about about spent me spending this money. Um, as long as I have the approval of, you know, our state um, person, and I typically, you know, will email her and get her to send, you know, yes, this is approved, or yes, this falls under. Um, they've been pretty much like, you know, it's, you know, you do what you need to do with the money. Um, so I've been really lucky in that situation, because I haven't had to really, you know, fight for, for the money or, or for ways to spend it. Um, you know, we were lucky enough that we had so few and they were all tended to be in the same area that we were able to use the same person. Um, although we did um, have to do some things with, we paid some for some things at the DMV for some families, had to do the same process of getting them to be a vendor. Um, luckily, the, the place we worked with was willing to accept a check and understood that it was going to take some time for the check to get there. And um, I would recommend if this is something that you want to do and you have the money, I would recommend opening a PO for maybe, let's say, you know, a certain amount of money that you're willing to put towards this. You know, maybe it's $3,000 or $5,000 um, if you have an open PO for it. And then each time that you need to to use it, it all goes under this one PO. So you're not trying to go get a PO each time you, you need something done. So I think if you did a PO, you know, um, if you have a, if you're using a credit card, you can do a PO to the bank company. 
um, like to the credit card company saying that this is for vehicle, you know, assistance or repairs. Um, or if you have a place like we did where it's kind of the same place was doing the repairs, you could open a PO for that one and kind of use it until it runs out. Um, but yeah, we've been, you know, our, I work with the director of transportation. I worked with our finance people, but, and, you know, my supervisor, who's the director of student services and all are pretty much like, if the state says you can do this, this is your money. And, you know, that sounds great to us. So I've been lucky in that sense that I haven't had a lot of pushback. Thanks, Paige. And thanks for sharing that about the purchase order. I think that's really helpful because I know that's that's a barrier in many LEAs. And so I appreciate that comment too. Um, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit and think about what happens after our HCY. Um, and so there is time. I want to say it just very clearly that there is time to get these processes set up, especially as you're starting to think about back to school and how you're going to provide transportation. Um, Paige mentioned a comment earlier about really looking at those transportation costs and weighing out, you know, is a is a simple car repair um, or a basic car repair a less expensive way to get a student to school than to have to reroute a bus or something like that. And so really thinking about that as an option for using your funds as we kind of approach that back to school time. Um, but also with that said, I know that September 30th will be here before we know it and January 2025 uh, will also be here before we know it. And so I want to kind of have some conversations around that sustainability question um, and what happens with this and how how will you continue to do car repairs, if you will. Um, so, Claire, I'll start with you with this one. Yeah, this is definitely something that's at top of mind right now as the school year is coming to a close. Um, so. We have pretty much gone through all of our ARP funds at this point that we were allotted. So um, our city actually released um, a grant for unhoused initiatives that they allowed the school district to be um, able to apply for. So I applied for that. Um, it is ARP dollars, but it, we have an extended timeline on it. So we'll be able to continue some of our funding through next school year, which is great through that. Um, I'm also looking into like the United Way in our county has some really interesting opportunities for grants. Um, and then we also have a program called Community Schools, which is a 501c3 that supports our school district. So we're just trying to get creative with kind of our partnerships and seeing who can, can support us. Um, and my role is fairly new to our district. Um, it's about six years old now. So the McKinney Mental Program was mostly in the hands of the school-based social workers. Um, so having one person kind of overseeing the things has allowed us to see how much need really is out there and, and what we can do with all these dollars, which is really exciting. Um, so I think we're also looking to evolve to hopefully have some sort of way to collect donations too, because we've seen that our community is really seeing the need and wants to help as well. Um, so we're just trying to get creative with the community partners grant opportunities and then you know working with our community who's been really supportive so far thanks claire well laura i'll turn it over to you um same question about sustainability and kind of what your plans are as you think about the post arp hcy um, timeline well i think um again like i was saying we've had um our help the homeless funds is what we call the the money that's unrestricted We've had that now for probably about eight, eight years, eight or nine years, and it's grown. And so a lot of people um, are familiar with our big fundraiser we do every um, December. It's Breakfast with Santa. All the proceeds are 100% go to our program. All the food and stuff is donated through the food services for the school division. Um, so thinking about that sustainability, obviously, is is important and a little scary because you really want to be able to look at all those different ways. So the things that I've looked at is, um, and just to go back, I guess right after the pandemic, um, you know, and just with the cost of everything increasing, we were getting a lot of referrals for like um, electric bills. So to, you know, we had done that before. So last school year, I looked at how much did I spend a lot a lot, we spent a lot, and, and that was through our Help the Homeless Funds. We spent over $16,000 last year helping people because we know if your lights are turned off, 
you know, and they're not turned back on, you're going to lose housing. So we felt like that was something, but I really had to review that and, and say, okay, um, now that things are getting a little bit back to normal, um, we need to kind of curb that. So I actually set an amount, you know, this is how much money we're going to spend this school year. So that is probably what I'm going to look at doing. Um, now we're very fortunate, like I said, because we do have this unrestricted money, but to really kind of cap that so that we have that set aside. Um, the other things I would encourage people to do, and I know you hear this all the time, but really get involved with churches in your community because you're going to have people that are car repair people and that own um, places that can and have connections. Those are, again, that's about that communication, that connection. Um, and so one of the things that we have a church that um, absolutely just, I mean, literally, like, I just never know when he's going to pop by and he'll just bring me a check. Sometimes he brings us 500, sometimes he brings us 1,000. I've got a couple of other people that I have um, done presentations in the community. Um, this, this gentleman's wife died and she loved kids and doing things for kids. And he brought me a check for $5,000 one day. And then I called him up a year later and said, hey, you know, just wondering if you would think about, you know, donating again. So I, it's again, kind of pulling those things together. And I think that it is something that we can, have as a, a sustainability plan um, because what I've learned about fundraising is people want to help. Um, telling people that, oh, donate money to our program. Most people are like, okay, but people like to know what do you need? What, what, where is my money specifically going? And I think that's the key. And it really is helpful if you could say, for example, like on our website, we list things that we need. We do different things when families get permanently housed. We can't use funds, any of our program funds for those things. So we specifically say we need these things. So I think that's another way to, to be able to get that information out there. And I think people are going to be more, um, they're going to be more apt to help and, and to also um, donate funds, but also people that have been all, you know, say this one guy, he's a master mechanic for 35 years, owned his own business. He just said, you know, even when I retire in a few years, I still want to help. Um, and a note on that, he also experienced homelessness when he was younger. And that came out through our conversation about our program. Um, so again, that's another connection of someone that wants to give back for a different reason. Thank you so much, Maura. I want to ask a follow-up question um, for you of how do you see your partnership continuing with your CTE programs regarding car repairs? I feel like um, it's just going to get stronger. Um, and, and here's just a note to everyone. You know, be familiar, be familiar with all of those ROTAC classes or for, I'm sorry, for us, it's Roanoke Technical Educational Center, but your CTE classes um, become involved in advisory council if you can, because you're going to meet a lot of partners at that table. Um, I had a meeting today. We had our, we have a quarterly meeting and I had it today. Um, and we meet for lunch every, you know, every quarter. And, and just to kind of throw out there when I, um, our percentages of our McKinney Vento students who are also involved in CTE are incredible. 64%, um, like middle school, 54%. It's really high numbers. And I feel like that that's another way to, to, to merge those things together, those two programs together. And um, I know that um, when we had a, um, we have a senior shine and dine where we recognize our seniors and we had that a few weeks ago. And so he, this person I'm talking about, he actually was our guest speaker. And so afterwards he said to me, he said, let's talk about what are some things that we can do better and improve even, you know, for this upcoming school year. The CTE program, um, and I'm really glad you brought that up, Karen. I just really recommend learning about that at your school division, what's available. Get yourself involved and be at the table because you're going to learn a lot. And that's how you're going to make some really, really great connections to be able to provide these services. Thank you so much for that. Paige, I'll ask the same question to you about sustainability um, and just kind of what your plans and what your thoughts are. But before you jump in, I just want to remind everyone um, that after Paige answers, we'll have opportunity to answer your questions as well. Um, so there's a few that are coming in through the Q&A. Please 
um, add any questions that you'd like to for any of our panelists or for all of our panelists. Um, so I just want to encourage you to do that um, while Paige is talking. So Paige, I'll turn it over to you. Well, my plan is not as concrete as others. Um, this is my first year, obviously. Um, I will piggyback on um, getting involved in your community. Um, I was asked to come speak at a church um, and talk about some of our needs. Um, from that church presentation, someone in that, in, in that women's group was involved with um, Kiwanis and I was then invited to come speak to our Kiwanis club. After I spoke with Kiwanis, someone stopped me after that and asked if I would come speak to newcomers. So, um, you know, trying to get involved and just get the information out there. I will also agree with Melora that um, one thing I did not do well, um, especially the first couple of times I spoke was asking for something in particular. Um, I was more just like, here's what we do. We have all these different needs. This is where we're spending our art money right now. This money's going away. Um, and I do think that people were, were in fact, when I um, went to Kiwanis, they were like, you know, can you ask for something specific? I think they were really looking to know like where their money was gonna go. Um, and so, you know, I kind of had to really sort of think about where, what, what were our needs and stuff. So I do think if you start working, start talking with community members to kind of have an idea of where you want that money to go. Um, and I wasn't really prepared to do that the first couple of times I spoke with someone. Um, but beyond that, you know, I, I'm trying to make as many relationships in the community as I can. Um, just from, you know, being on this webinar, I'm definitely, I am, I, I am on our CT advisory, but I'm going to try to get a little, you know, a little closer with our automotive people and, and, and talk with them and stuff. But I, I agree. It, it sounds like everyone, you know, Claire and Melora are doing the same thing. It's really about building relationships um, with your, within your school division and also within your community and um, just asking for help. It's shocking what people will give you and do for you if you just ask. Thanks so much, Paige. Um, I wanna open this question up to any of you who wanna jump in to answer, um, but one question came in through the Q&A panel um, about whether or not you were required to get bids for repairs. Um, so whether you had to go through any kind of bidding process. We, we, we weren't. Um, typically bids, I mean, for us, I mean, I think our limit is if you're spending more than like $10,000 for something at one time. So you really have to, or, you know, even if you did a PO, you, you want to keep your, like, I never do a PO for more than 10,000, depending on what I'm doing. Um, so I think you just have to kind of know what those guidelines are. Um, but as far as like, for us, we did not have to get any kind of bids or anything. And I think that, um, you know, if it was something that we were doing like all the time, every day, I mean, that might be something different, but for the most part, um, you know, I think with the amounts that we're spending, that hasn't been an issue. Thanks for that. We one. did not have to get bids either, and we didn't have to get any kind of comparisons or anything on the invoices that that they sent. Um, we just kind of went with, you know, obviously you have to trust who you're going to, or like Claire talked about, you know, have someone you can go to, to look it over and say, does this look fair? But, you know, we didn't have to, we just kind of went with the invoice that we got. Yeah, it's more just to get a sense of scope and understanding, um, but not a requirement that, that was set by us either. Thank you for that. Um, one question came in about helping a student um, who is experiencing homelessness to find a car. And so, Laura, you talked a little bit about this with um, partnering with your CTE programs, but wondering if you have any other advice for students, our older students who are experiencing homelessness, um, who could also really benefit from having that access for some of those incidental benefits that you mentioned, like appointments and jobs and things like that. Um, so wanted to just pose that question to see what recommendations or what advice um, would you have for this liaison? Um, I think definitely, <clears throat> again, I go back to it. I, and it depends. It depends on like how, um, what CTE, you know, in your CTE program, 
Um, typically automotive is one of them. <clears throat> so kind of find out if they, you know, when they repair cars or when cars are donated, um, typically they're fixed. Um, they're going to determine, hey, we can fix this before they take the car, but then turn around and sell it to put money back into the program. I think that's a great place to start because I feel like, especially within your school division, if you have a student um, <clears throat> who especially is experiencing homelessness and maybe an unaccompanied youth too, um, that you're probably going to have someone that's really going to, they're really going to look at that student and probably want to help them. And you might get more help than you would imagine. The other thing that I just found this out recently, and I don't have tons of information, but I can try to get some more information and send it to you, Karen, and maybe you can share it or whatever. But um, so we have this resource center in our community. And so my staff and I went out, it's in one of our, um, it's in one of our large apartment complexes. And um, so we went out and met with them and they have this really cool resource center um, so that families can come in and get all kinds of just different, ask questions, get resources. They have meetings at this place, you know, different kinds of activities for kids. And there was a program that was just getting started um, and they were also sponsored through one of the credit unions. And they were actually telling us that, you know, if, if someone is referred to us and you had to be, I think you had to be 18 or older, but if you refer to them, that they would work with, with um, especially like older youth and trying to help them get a car and, you know, get a loan for the car and knowing that a lot of them are trying to establish credit. Um, that's another other opportunities that they had. So I'll look into that and kind of send that to you. But it was especially geared towards uh, people who also had not so great credit or didn't have credit. Um, so I will also see if I can get some more information and send that to you as well. Thank you so much. Clara Page, do you have any insights or ideas for this liaison on anything different? Cars are a tough one, especially for youth, because you have to think about all those other factors of like, can they sustain insurance and all those things? Um, I think connecting, like Melora said, with um, that CTE program again, or um, the, the credit union is a really good point, too, because they often have are ingrained within the community. And so that can be a really great resource um, and kind of the double support, like you said, of the, the credit and um, understanding how the car purchasing process works. Um, sometimes there are programs for if they're aging out of foster care, I'm assuming they're in that 18 to 24 range. So sometimes there are programs that really focus on kiddos who are aging out. Um, so that may be another opportunity in your community if they have some additional supports too. Thank you for that. We did have someone in the Q&A panel also say, yes, I would definitely like more information about that program, Melora. So um, if you want to send that to me, we can send that out and post that information for participants as well. Um, we did have a question come in um, specifically from someone who's working with um, students in foster care. Um, and so thinking about how to refer families to schools. Um, so I want to kind of flip the question a little bit because I know that you all, your the work that you do and your expertise is working with students experiencing homelessness. Um, but so if someone is co contacting you or working in a nonprofit organization that's working with students who are experiencing homelessness, what's the best way to refer them to you for support with things like transportation? What was the last part of that question, Karen? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. No, that's okay. What's the best way for them to refer families or students to you um, if they're looking for support with transportation? And that would be for the foster care? Well, I kind of flipped the question a little bit. The question came in specific to foster care, but since you all are um, here talking about your McKinney Vento programs and your students experiencing homelessness, um, kind of flipping the question to be specific to our students and families experiencing homelessness. Yeah. So if there is someone who is like, how are they referred to our office, basically? Yeah, if they need, if someone in a community organization knew that they needed support with transportation, for example, um, how would they go about connecting with you? Um, so one of the things, again, we've set up all different types of protocol, but we have, um, obviously we have information on our website. Uh, we also have on our brochures, but we set, we um, have a dedicated email that, that is for parents that want to make, or anybody that wants to make a direct referral 
get more information about our program. Um, also for all of our community partners. So, and then we have something separate that's more of an internal referral process. That has been extremely helpful. Another thing that I'll throw out there to think about. Um, so all of us, you know, we're all connected somehow to a, a COC, whether, and sometimes it might not be like in a large area, you know, you might be more rural, but there is some kind of connection to the continuum of care. Um, so for us too, we get a lot of referrals. People come through what for here, they call it central intake. So it's people that are, are maybe at risk of losing housing or need money to help pay for housing. So we get a lot of referrals sometimes um, that they're not, they're not homeless now, but they're at risk of being homeless. It's another opportunity that if we can help them, because we run funds through central intake too, to help with some of those costs, um, that's another way for us to reach out and connect to them as well. And we let community, um, a lot of the community providers will often send families, you know, they'll call us and say, hey, we have this going on. Is this a family you think maybe you could offer services to? Um, and also, if you, I know for us, DePaul Family Services here in Roanoke, I know they're in some other areas too of uh, Virginia, um, but they have a program that they started where um, it, it's more they got grant money to help those that have like informal kinship care. So they've also been making some referrals to us to see if they're possibly um, eligible for McKinney Vento and they could be. So that's some other ways we've been able to get referrals from the community. I hope that answered the question. Yes, thank you so much. And I will say um, one of the things you said of having that referral process with your community partners is so important, both within your school community and within with the community partners that you work with, um, so that sometimes we don't hear about our students who are in those situations until they need something like transportation. And so that um, that can be a really important connection to say, hey, I just learned about this student. I want to make sure they're on your radar and they have access to that transportation um, or whatever it is that they need. So thank you so much. Yeah, Melora kind of touched on this, but um, districts are required to have their McKinney Vento or homeless liaison really is the person who will be titled on there and foster care liaison on their website. Sometimes it takes a little bit of digging to find it, um, but it is there. So that's always a good place to start or the school social worker generally should have the information of how to guide them kind of in the right direction. So there's kind of two pathways to that. Thank you so much. I want to open it up one more time to our panelists for any additional thoughts. Um, this has been really, really fantastic information about car repairs and how you've navigated that and the partnerships you've created. Um, so really, really grateful for that. But just want to see if anyone has any kind of last minute thoughts for us. Um, I was just going to add, I think, oh, hang on, we have school announcements, sorry, going on. <laughs> I'm going to pause for one second. <laughs> okay, cool, end of day. Um, so uh, I just wanted to add, Melora kind of touched on like the, how much more a car can mean to a family. And I would say like in Wisconsin, especially in the county that we're in, we have a very small amount of family shelter space right now and we have a long long wait list and I know a lot of people around the country are facing that and cars can be home for a lot of our families and so also you know not only trying to help families break cycles of poverty by continuing to access their job and things to continue to have income it's also just like a safe space for a family to be and so um, that was another kind of driving factor is just knowing that our county is really struggling as a whole. So like if we can add this one little piece of a car repair that can keep it functioning. So it's a warm or safe space for a family. Um, that was kind of another another reason that we wanted to make sure that some of the dollars went to that. Thank you for that. Laura or Paige, any last minute thoughts for us? I don't think so. I'm learning as much as I'm sharing and I appreciate you having me. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, I just love the opportunity, um, you know, to share because I mean, so all of us across the country are doing amazing work and we're working hard every day and always trying to help find new ways to support our families. Um, and I, I, I believe too, that one of the things, um, you know, I like to um, <clears throat> share this because I think it's important for us to hear this. 
recently helped a family um, with, with the utility bill. They were at risk of having their power turned off. Um, but through that process, it was a family that we had worked with for many years, and she has been permanently housed for four years. And so it's like that celebration. But when she called and was asking for help, she's like, I feel bad asking. I'm like, you know, don't ever feel that way. If we can help, we will. If we can't, then we'll let you know we can't. But at the end of the conversation, she said, I want to do something to give back. And I think this is important for us to keep in our minds too, um, because we're out here giving and giving and giving. And we have to remember, because I learned if someone says that, you know, I say, what kind of things are you thinking? Because this is often something that is so important to them. And I said, specifically, we do welcome home baskets for our families when they get permanently housed. If you want to just pick up a couple of rolls of paper towels when you go to the grocery store, you know, and just, and, and that is something that I think I didn't realize how much joy that brings to a lot of our families that we've been able to provide services to. Um, and I just shared that because I just thought that was something really cool because it was important to her. And um, instead of me saying, you don't have to do anything, I just basically say, hey, what are your thoughts about what you'd like to give? So just wanted to add that to you. Thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Anna Sophia again. But before I do that, Claire Melora Page, thank you so much um, for being here with us, for sharing this great information. I'm super appreciative of your time and all that you're doing. So um, thank you so much. I will turn it back over to Anna Sophia. I also want to say thank you. That was amazing. I think I tried to be like an RBHCY optimist. I know that all these funds are coming to an end and some great programs are going to be wrapped up, but I think the lessons that you are all sharing with us will be long lasting. So thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to wrap us up with a couple of slides here. Again, just want to put another reminder for our scholarship program. Um, I just want to plug, I don't think I said this earlier, but uh, this is open to any students who have experienced homelessness within the last six years. And um, it's also open for students who are undocumented. So we know that for that particular population, there is limited options. So just something to keep in mind that um, that application will be closing up in June. So make sure to check that out. Um, I also wanted to just highlight a couple of resources. Um, so again, we have on our webpage any resources around um, the new federal guidance, the Dear Colleague letter that we touched on earlier. You can go ahead and download that and read up on the allowable uses as well. Um, our American Rescue Plan Homeless Children and Youth resource page has a wealth of resources. Again, MOUs, um, you can just download things and use them for your district. So if you're thinking about how to spend those funds in the coming weeks, please feel free to check that out. And of course, we have our uh, Flexing the Flexibility series, which just touches on, again, some additional ideas for how you may be able to spend any outstanding funds. Um, I want to make a big, big plug for our final ARPHCY um, help, well, I guess kind of webinar, <laughs> but um, we will be having a, a help desk um, in May. And so we encourage you all to sign up and register. That registration is open on our website. Um, and if you have any questions, if you just want to get some ideas about what to do, we know, again, we're getting close to that spent obligation deadline. Please feel free to join us and we will be happy to be there. Um, and this always happens to me. Sorry, can you still see my slides, Karen? Okay, great. Um, let me... Okay, and the last thing is, um, again, reminder that we are on all the socials and please feel free to um, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, X, formerly Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. This is the QR code for our mailing list. So again, encourage you all to sign up to be up to date about all of our updates um, and upcoming resources and webinars. And again, this is the link to our uh, Slack community. So if you have any other questions coming out of today, we encourage you to share them in our Slack channel. And I believe this is my last slide. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you soon, hopefully at our, our BHCY office hours.